I shut my eyes and I turn my mind to my most distant memories in order to see the image that will appear to me most spontaneously with the greatest visual vividness. I see two cypresses, two large cypresses of almost equal height. I see these cypresses through the window of classroom one of the Christian Brothers School of Figueres. From my seat I could also observe the paintings on the walls of the corridor outside. I could see only two of them distinctly. One represented a fox's head emerging from a cavern. The other was a copy of Millet's Angelus. This painting produced in me an obscure anguish, so poignant that the memory of those two motionless silhouettes pursued me for several years with a constant uneasiness provoked by their continual and ambiguous presence. When I look at Millet's Angelus, the first recollections to come out of my store of memory bring back the twilight and elegiac feeling of childhood. The woman with her hands together strikes me as symbolic of the exhibitionistic eroticism of a virgin in waiting. As for the man, he is riveted to the spot, as if hypnotized by the mother. It may be noted that in Freudian vocabulary, his hat stands for the sexual arousal being hidden, to show his attitude of shame over his virility. The erotic significance of the wheelbarrow is as undeniable as that of the pitchfork driven into the ploughed earth. Dali's obsession with Millet's picture, one of the great icons of European painting, became a constant theme in his work. It was the first of a series of obsessions which preoccupied him throughout his life. As a child, Dali was asthmatic, and his illness became so severe that his parents decided to send him away to friends in the country. The Pichot family moved in the sophisticated society of Barcelona and were renowned for their musical and artistic prowess. The Pichot country house was a converted mill to which they'd added a circular tower. My daily visit to the top of the tower was the most eagerly awaited and the most solemn moment of my day. On it, I began to develop the grandiose reveries which I'd begun previously on the roof of my parents' house in Figueres. I would imagine myself set up as a bloody tyrant, reducing all contemporary peoples to slavery for the sole satisfaction of my luxurious and fantastic egocentric caprices. I would abase myself to the humble and degrading condition of the pariah, would uselessly sacrifice himself in the most romantic of deaths. From the cruel demigod to the humble worker, Passing through the stages of the artist to the total genius, I have always arrived at the saviour. Salvador, Salvador, Salvador. I could repeat my own name tirelessly. The walls of the dining room were entirely covered with oil paintings and coloured etchings, most of them originals by Ramon Pichot, who at this time lived in Paris. These breakfasts were my discovery of French Impressionism, the school of painting which has in fact made the deepest impression on me in my life. It represented my first contact with an anti-academic and revolutionary aesthetic of painting. Dali began to paint himself, and under the influence of Pichot, his first canvases were in the late Impressionist style. The Pichot family recognized Dali's extraordinary talent and persuaded his reluctant father to send him to the Academy of Fine Art in Madrid. At the student's residencia where he lived, Dali came into contact with contemporaries who were advanced in their ideas and cosmopolitan in their tastes. He formed two friendships which were to have a crucial effect on his life. Luis Bunuel was a natural history student from Aragon. He was to become Spain's greatest filmmaker. Federico Garcia Lorca, from Andalusia, was already emerging as Spain's leading writer. Within the residencia, there was a sort of segregation based on intellectual snobbery. 
around Federico Garcia Lorca and Luis Buñuel, a small avant-garde literary and artistic group had taken shape. One of its members, passing down the corridor one day, peeked through the open door of my cell-like room and saw the cubist canvas on the easel I was working at. He imparted this news to the others, who had thought I was backward-looking, and were happily surprised at my avant-gardism. They made me one of them. With them and through them, I first heard the expression that was to be so successful and make me so at the same time. It's Darlinian. Even the relatively liberal atmosphere of the academy could not support Dali's extravagant behaviour, and he was frequently disciplined. Yo abro mi papel y me encuentro con Rafael. Tenía que hablar con Rafael. Entonces me levanté y dijo, dije, señores, con todo el respeto, me es imposible hablar de ese sujeto delante de los tres profesores porque yo sé mucho más sobre Rafael que todos ustedes reunidos. Entonces, naturalmente, consejo de disciplina y expulsión por un año de la escuela. On my arrival in Figueres, I found my father thunderstruck by the catastrophe of my expulsion, which had shattered all his hopes that I might succeed in an official career. With my sister, he posed for a pencil drawing, which was one of my most successful of this period. In the expression of my father's face can be seen the mark of the pathetic bitterness which my expulsion from the academy had produced on him. Despite his father's disapproval, Dali continued to paint. In the seaside town of Cadaquez, he began to produce canvases which show a new interest, surrealism. In the magazine La Révolution Surréaliste, Dali had seen reproductions of the work of artists like the Catalan Juan Miró. Their work impressed him, and under this new influence, he began to discover a style of his own. Whilst he was a student, Dali's pictures had been exhibited in the Catalan capital, Barcelona. Catalan artists like Picasso and Miro were the leading painters in Paris, and dealers in Barcelona were keen to promote the next generation. La, las obras de Dalí. La reacción del público fue extraordinaria, ¿verdad? Había una serie de protestas públicas, digamos, sobre la obra. Así es que hubo muchas caricaturas, por ejemplo, en las revistas de arte, y que muchos se burlaban de la obra de Dalí, y muchas caricaturas preguntaban qué quiere decir esto o qué representa esto, ¿verdad? Así es que el punto de atracción máximo de los salones de otoño fue precisamente la obra de Dalí. ¿Y se vendió? Sí, se vendieron todos. En los 1920s, Paris was the cultural center of the world. It was dominated by the surrealist movement, which Dali had heard so much about in Spain. Figures like Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray were dedicated to the pursuit of the irrational and the exploration of the subconscious. Among many provocative announcements, they offered but their idea of beauty was the chance encounter of a sewing machine and an umbrella on a dissecting table. I always have the feeling that the, the 20s and the 30s and the Dada movement and the surrealist movement, it, there was a, it was a great deal of fun. No, not at the time. People just look back to it and think it's a marvelous period, romantic and all that sort of thing. But no, it was very tense. It was very bitter and there was no humor in it. But what we did was really uh, to upset things, you know. But subconsciously to clear the way, as I said before, for something new which we didn't know yet what it might be. The Surrealist group's leading figure, the Pope, was André Breton. 
His idols were Lenin and Freud, and it was he who dictated the movement's ideology and politics. Breton's closest associate, the poet Paul Eloi, was already familiar with Dali, whose talents had been recommended to him by Lorca. Louis Bunuel was already in Paris. He'd come into contact with the Surrealist group and had embarked on his career as a filmmaker. It was at about this period that Louis Bunuel one day outlined to me an idea he had for a motion picture that he wanted to make, for which his mother was going to lend him the money. His idea for a film struck me as extremely mediocre. It was avant-garde in an incredibly naive sort of way, and I told him that this film story of his did not have the slightest interest but that I, on the other hand, had just written a very short scenario which had the touch of genius and which went completely counter to the contemporary cinema. 